of God speak. Well, today is the start of what is referred to in some circles as Holy Week. It's the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry and life. It culminates, I'm sorry, it starts with his entry into Jerusalem and it culminates with his resurrection from the dead on the following Sunday. Um, His ministry lasted about three years. And of course, Holy Week recognizes his final week of ministry. Now what transpires in this final week of ministry is of incredible importance. You get a feel for the significance of the events of this final week when you consider how much space is given to this week in the Gospels. For example, in the book of Matthew, there are a total of 28 chapters. Eight of them, or approximately 29% of the book, is dedicated to just this last week of Jesus' life. In the Gospel of Mark, there are 16 chapters. Six of them, or approximately 38% of the book, is dedicated to his last week. In the book of Luke, where we're in today, there are 24 chapters. Six of them dedicated to his final week, or approximately 25% of the book. Now John dedicates the most space to his final week. In John there are 21 chapters with 12 of the or 10 of them 48% of the book being dedicated to his final week. And more than that, four chapters or a total of 20% of the book of John is his final night with the disciples. So the events when you consider that Jesus had a 3-year ministry and as the Writers of the Gospels wrote down the events of Jesus' life. They spent a lot of ink on one week. It is a significant week. And today, being the start of what's known in some circles as Holy Week, many churches celebrate what's called Palm Sunday. And in fact, our children up in Children's Church will be waving palms around and learning about Palm Sunday. I have to confess that I've always found it kind of silly when adults are in the sanctuary waving palms around, so I kind of, you know, didn't do that. If that bothers you not waving palms around, then, you know, talk to me after the service and maybe we can do something about it next year. But where do we get the word Palm Sunday? Well, The triumphal entry is recorded in all four Gospels. Now this tells you it's a very significant thing. Very few events in Jesus' life are recorded in all four Gospels. Not even his birth. His birth is only recorded in two Gospels. But yet the triumphal entry into Jerusalem is such a significant event that it's recorded in all four Gospels. Now three of the Gospels simply say that they put branches and coats and stuff on the ground. But in... uh, in In uh, the Gospel of John, in chapter 12, it specifies that they were palm branches. So that's where we get the name Palm Sunday. Where they went and cut down branches so that way as a king entering, he wouldn't have to step on the dirt of the ground. That was the ancient Near Eastern practice that sort of led to them putting their coats and, and branches on the ground. Because as a triumphant king... He was victorious and should not have to be sullied by dirt, was the image culturally that they were conveying. Palm Sunday. Throughout the years of the Christian tradition, there has arisen the practice of Lent. And in some traditions, they celebrate what's, or they observe what's called Ash Wednesday at the very start of this season called Lent that leads up to Easter. And as you know, they go into their worship service and their priest or their minister, they'll make the sign of the cross on their forehead in ashes. Do you know what they use for those ashes? The palms from the previous year's Palm Sunday. Now, I don't observe Ash Wednesday, but the imagery is telling. And it strikes at the very heart of what goes on here. 
that these branches that they're waving as signs of their joy and adoration and loyalty to King Jesus become next year the very symbol that they use of their contrition because our sin has demonstrated and proven that our signs of effusive praise fall short. And when the times get tough and the going gets rough, we tend to do what the crowd has done here and run away. And so what is one time a source of praise is at another time a source of penance. So the season of Lent, from the human perspective, is talking about our need for forgiveness. Because even our best attempts at praising and being faithful fall short. Now in terms of the significance of salvation history, what happens here in the triumphal entry that is again recorded in all four Gospels is a big deal. It underscores the fact that David is the descendant of David and Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to David to have a king on the throne. And so when Jesus rides into town, it is a coronation ceremony, so to speak. It's rife with Old Testament imagery of the salvation that comes. When David, the first king of the Davidic line, conquered what is known as Jerusalem, he rode in in triumph. And here Jesus, the last, the final, the perfect Davidic king, rides into Jerusalem. But is he riding as a great mighty conqueror? No. He rides on a lowly donkey. You'll hear some people in some traditions try to tell you that this was a sign of no. No, it was not. It was not the Cadillac of the day. A donkey's always been a donkey. <laughs> right? Alexander the Great did not ride donkeys. He rode chargers. Caesar did not ride donkeys. He rode war horses. Jesus comes subverting all of our expectations of what victory, of what a king looks like. Now, a great many people have taught a great many things about the significance of the triumphal entry and what it tells us about Jesus. And it tells us great and wonderful things. But today I want to focus on the human response to Jesus. Because in this passage, I think we see three possible human responses to Jesus. What we see in this passage is people responding to Jesus a certain way and it all comes down to their agenda. Their agenda. People have agendas. People want something. We're told that when, when I went to CPE, this clinical pastoral education training where they, where they spent a year teaching me how to do a hospital visit, um, they told us you should not have an agenda when you enter the room. You should just go in there as this nebulous spiritual thing and reflect back to them whatever their beliefs want. Well, that's pagan. But it's also impossible to go in there without an agenda because even the plan of reflecting back to them what they want is my agenda. But in this passage, we see three different agendas at work. And how it affects their responses. And these are three ways that people respond to Jesus. And it all comes down to your agenda. So let's look at them. In no particular order. You see the agenda of the guy who owns the cult. What are you talking about? He doesn't have an agenda. I mean... He just asks a question, why are you untying the colt? I mean, if you came outside and you were turning the keys in my car, I'd ask you, what are you doing? Which is basically what he asks. And his disciples respond, the Lord has need of it. 
And then so what does the guy say in response to that? Nothing. At least nothing that's recorded. In other words, we see here an agenda that is centered around responding to the direction and needs of the king. Okay. On the other end of the passage, we see the religious leaders wanting Jesus' disciples scolded. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They, throughout the course of Jesus' life and ministry, had been confronted by, their, by him for their hypocrisy, for their holier-than-thou attitude, for their elevation of tradition over the law of God. And so their agenda was one of self-defense. And they thought Jesus was a threat to the status quo. And so they recoiled at Jesus. Now sometimes we are like the guy who owns the cult where we just respond to the direction of Jesus. And admittedly, that is the right way to be. In the church, typically speaking, we aren't usually the religious leaders who recoil at the teaching of Jesus. Or are we? Anyway. No, we find ourselves usually in the place of the crowd. The crowd. Man, right here, it's amazing. Jesus rides into town. And He is riding a wave of popularity. I mean, He is riding a wave better than any surfboarder off the coast of Hawaii I've ever seen. Okay? It's amazing. We think that there's going to be a king installed on a throne in the very new future on the, by the way they're responding to him. I mean, look at some of the things they say in, uh, in Luke 9. I mean, sorry, in, uh, in Mark. Blessed is the kingdom and the coming of our father David. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the king of Israel. The crowd very clearly has in mind that David is, and his son reign, and that Jesus, being the son of David, is the rightful king. So then in John, they actually call him the king. They're so enthused about Jesus that they make treasonous statements. Because Rome didn't suffer other kings. So they very clearly are making some exuberant praises of Jesus. But yet we know that it was only skin deep. It was only skin deep. In our passage in Luke 19, it specifies they were praising Him for all the great things they'd seen. So as Jesus was coming into town, these people were, were lining the streets. They were excited. Oh boy, here comes our future King. They had very real expectations for Jesus. They had an agenda. Who knows what personal agendas were in the minds of each person there? Maybe they'd been and they'd seen him feeding the multitudes. Oh man, Jesus can feed me. Maybe they'd had a relative or a friend healed. Oh man, Jesus can. Make my body whole. Maybe Jesus had been seen rebuking the leaders who made them feel like they were nothing. Oh man, Jesus will stick it to the man. Or maybe they just were doing the mental calculus and they thought, hey, Jesus can elicit a following and if we get enough people, we can throw off Rome's shackles. Either way. They had an agenda. And then just a few days later, Jesus reveals that He's not going along with their agenda. And what happens? The crowds turn on Him. When Jesus is standing before Pilate, it is not just the religious leaders accusing Him. It's the crowds. That is how fickle 
humans are. One minute you're a hero, another minute you're a zero, as soon as you fail to live up to their expectation. Jesus was confronted by the agendas of all these people. And what did he do? He kept riding his donkey into town. A man on a mission. Today, there are many people who are waving palms for Jesus. Jesus, Jesus! Maybe they're thinking that Jesus is like John Lennon. Man, we just need some love. Love! All we need is love. Maybe they're thinking that Jesus is going to be like Ronald Reagan for them. You know? Or that he's going to be like Bernie Sanders. Or that he's going to be like Mr. Rogers. Or that he's going to just be like the genie in Aladdin's lamp. The wish fulfiller. We have expectations. So many people have so many expectations. And what we see in this passage is Jesus on a mission. So, what is his mission? Well, he is here to bear the sin of the world. And he rolls into town knowing that the very words of adoration that he's hearing are going to turn to cries of condemnation within a week. And does that dissuade him? Does that deter him? No. He keeps on keeping on. We see the agenda of God here. To reconcile a people to himself, he went beyond our agendas. And he went to the root of the problem. The sin that separates us from him and causes strife with one another. And along the way, Jesus claims his crown, but he does it in a way that is offensive even to our sensibilities. You see, the people who lined the streets when he rolled into Jerusalem had a very clear understanding of what success and a big win looks like. And we have an idea of what the big win looks like. See, we know the end of the story that he rises from the grave and that he ascends into heaven and he's victorious over all the powers of sin and darkness, but he does it through death, through being publicly humiliated, through being betrayed by one of his close friends, by being exposed naked, hanging from a tree, while the crowds, the very people he came to serve, murdered him. See, we don't think like that. And that's offensive to us. The idea that the big win comes through suffering, that's foreign to us. We think in terms of the big win comes as a result of a steady string of little wins. That's how you win. That's how you win a war. You you fight a series of battles and you win them and eventually you win the war. That's how you win the March Madness college playoff bracket. You keep winning. Big wins come after you've made little wins. There are people out there who think that that's what the Christian life is like. That victory, that success, that glory is an ever onward march of success through the Christian life. And here we see Jesus on a mission to die. The big win comes on the tail end of suffering, of loss. It's not salvation from suffering. It's salvation through suffering. So there are hard words in this. There are people who wave the banner of Jesus. I've ministered to them and you've known them. Who wave the banner of Jesus just so long as they think that Jesus will make their kids grow up to be well-adjusted adults. But as soon as their kids rebel, Jesus... There are people who wave the banner of Jesus just so long as they think that Jesus is going to make their marriage great. But as soon as their spouse doesn't turn out to be the spouse they thought they'd be, oh, Jesus. uh, uh. Or man, Jesus is Lord as long as it's 
culturally convenient to be a Christian, but as soon as it becomes a little hard, man, we're not sure about this Jesus fellow. Oh man, I'll be a Christian business person. Oh, praising God and glorifying Him with my business until it hurts to do so. But the way of Jesus in the triumphal entry is to teach us the big win comes not from suffering, but through suffering. And does not Jesus tell us this when He said that in this world you will have unbridled success? Does He say that? No. In this world you will have what? Sorrow, trouble. But take heart. For why? I have overcome the world. Okay, so at the triumphal entry, we see three different agendas at play. There are some who look at Jesus as a threat to the status quo. These religious leaders demonstrate that. There are people who view Jesus as a threat I mean, they get really wild, riled up about Jesus. Most of you aren't there. But there's the two other groups. There's the crowds who are praising Jesus. Yay! Because it's convenient, it's safe, it's fun. There's something in it to be had for me. But what do we do when Jesus doesn't live up to our expectations? What do we do? Do we go the route of the crowds? Or do we recognize that maybe, maybe we were just trying to throw onto Jesus an agenda that was not his? So let us be like this man, this unnamed man who owned a colt, a donkey, who when told the Lord has need of it, it's the last word. I mean, in my military mind, I, I envision him, to use a military, saluting and saying, yes, sir. That's what I envision. When Jesus places hard expectations, costly expectations before you, what do you do? Do you turn tail and run? Do you react negatively? Or do you say, yes, Lord? Three different responses, three different agendas. All because of who Jesus is. His agenda was the cross, bearing your sin. And he wasn't going to let little agendas get in the way of keeping his big goal in mind. He's on a mission. Are we going to join him on his mission? Or only go so far as we think we can get benefit for our missions and our agendas? And in the process, lose out on all the glory He has for us. What do we do? You have an agenda. We all do. Is your agenda aligned to the agenda of Christ? Or have you just piggybacked on to Jesus because you think there's something in it for you? What is it? At this time of year, we get to celebrate how Jesus came. And he spent his last week really drilling down on the fact that he is the way, the truth, and the life. In him, there is life. In him, we have relationship with the Father and the Spirit. In him, we have meaning and purpose. In him, we have righteousness. But if we're too busy pursuing our agendas, we miss it. And all we see is Jesus the genie, Jesus the good luck charm, Jesus the Reagan, Jesus the Sanders, whatever. No. He's Jesus, Lord of Lords. Jesus, King of Kings, who came to bear your sin and to give you His righteousness. That in the final day, you may be raised up and be vindicated before God the Father and enter into an eternal weight of glory. But in the here and now, Jesus does not promise us an unending parade of celebration. It's not salvation from suffering. It's salvation through. Will you submit to the agenda 
of Christ. Let's pray. 